My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. Well, thank you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, for Al Mahadeen Television, coming to you from London, but discussing Ukraine, which means, more or less, we're discussing the whole world. The war drags on and on, and for much longer than most of the political class and virtually all of the media class seem to appreciate. This war began in 2014. Eight long years of bloody attrition has been taking place in Ukraine. Ever since the elected government was overthrown in a coup motivated by, financed by, and many people believe organized by, the United States of America. You'll recall Victoria Newland when asked what the EU would think of this. She replied famously, well, I can't really say it on a family programme, but it was F the EU, if you get my drift. This war has cost the lives of many thousands of people. 14,000 in the eastern part of Ukraine between 2014 and February of this year alone. But the proximate reason for this debate and debates all over the world are that the Russian forces entered the country with war aims that may or may not have already been realized. The question we are asking here today is what will bring the Ukraine war to an end? And we've all got different points of view on that. Some think that it shouldn't come to an end. There are many people in Washington, for example, that would like the war to drag on for a decade and make Ukraine, Russia's Afghanistan all over again. But we might not talk about Afghanistan quite so much because less than one year ago, the United States Armed Forces stole from that country like thieves in the night, defeated by men in sandals and riding bicycles. But they seem to imagine they can fight, confront, bleed, maybe break up, certainly maybe regime change, uh, the nuclear-armed hypersonic superpower of the Russian Federation. Some chance, I think. Having said that, far, far too many people have died in this war from 2014 right up until this very day. Died on both sides, killed by both sides. Allegations of war crimes, thick in the air, many of them bogus, some of them undoubtedly real. There are some things that when seen on social media can never be unseen. But the first casualty of war is, of course, truth, and truth was butchered in the Ukraine a long time ago. Now, I have my own views on what the final outcome of this latest part of the conflict is likely to be, perhaps even should be. But my guests, who are, of course, the acknowledged experts, I'm merely the enthusiastic amateur, will have their own point of view. And as this is Kali Mahorra, free word, everyone has the right to theirs. I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Jyoti Brar, a legendary political activist. She drove all the way from London to the Gaza Strip with me and would have done so again if I'd been prepared to take her. She's the deputy leader of the Workers' Party of Britain, of which I am myself a member. 
but she's the author of a very timely book, as it's turned out, about the war drive against both Russia and China, emanating from the United States and NATO. On my left is Jerry Downing, who is, describes himself as a retired bus driver, just like Nicolas Maduro, who was a bus driver when I first met him. So there's hope that Jerry could be the president here one day if we become a republic, if you get my drift. Jerry is a veteran political activist, a Trotskyist, and a regular guest on the show. Hugh Barnes we're very lucky to have for lots of reasons. One of them is that he's just back from Ukraine and that he was arrested near to a nuclear plant by the Ukrainian uh, security forces, the SBU, whilst there. And Hugh is the editor of The Green Socialist. He's an academic, uh, but he's also a war reporter who's reported from behind the lines, behind the enemy lines, whoever the enemy was, in Chechnya, in the Balkans, and in Afghanistan. Very happy to see you, Hugh. Tell us, first of all, about your arrest. The viewers would be delighted to hear it. We're very glad to see you. Well, I was in a town called Zaporizhia, which is uh, uh, to the southeast of Kiev, just beyond Dnipro. I was actually, I had a couple of days off. It was the Friday, the end of a week, and I'd been seeing a lot of death and destruction. And I happened to be a great fan of uh, Alexander Tsvasman, who's the father of Soviet jazz, and he was born in Zaporizhia. So I went on a kind of uh, excursion, a pilgrimage, if you like, to look at, and just so happened as I was in Zaporizhia, um, Putin's army bombed the nuclear power station there, which is a is a, is a first. I mean, it's never happened before in history. It's disputed, of course. It's said that well, it, uh, uh, shelling was in the outbuildings, not the they, 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 they certainly hit the training centre, which was adjacent. But there are six reactors there. And uh, the you know, indiscriminate nature of kind of Russian shelling anyway, I think that we, we ought to kind of accept that it was a reckless, a reckless is, thing to... All shelling is indiscriminate. All shelling is, is, is reckless and all shelling is indiscriminate and no shelling should be allowed or approved of. Um, so, it, so I was there. I mean, it was, you know, as I say, an extraordinary, unprecedented event. Uh, and I was the only foreign journalist in the city and I was doing what journalists do, which I was talking to people and taking photographs, and I was arrested by the police originally, but I went up the kind of intelligence food chain mm -hmm. and ended up being held by the SBU, um, who claimed that I was a Ruski divesant, a Russian spy. They could have asked me, I'd have dismissed that out of hand. All I would say is if I am a Ruski divesant, I'm very good. <laughs> very deep cover. <laughs> totally deep cover. So give us, uh, from the battlefield, as it were, uh, your take on events, but then segue into how this war might end. OK, well, it, I mean, you, you've, you've contextualised the, the thing with your introduction. You've said a lot of things. I have enormous respect for you as a fellow socialist. Um, and, and you've said many things which I agree with. I'm not an apologist for the NATO alliance. I, I, I'm certainly not an apologist for expansion into Eastern Europe. I do think we have to be careful about sort of moral equivalence fallacy. And, and I accept that this war has been going on for eight years. I was in Crimea in February 2014. I was in the Donbass in March 2014. I was at the beginning of this war as well as, I wish it was the end of this mm. war, as well as this kind of intermediate point now. So I, I accept, which is the important point that you've made, that this is a war that has been going on for a long time. But, but I understood that I was coming on this programme, not that there's a problem talking about something else, to talk about the war, the invasion that was signalled by Putin on the 24th of February of Go this ahead. year. No, no. I mean, I, I think that... Say no. anything that you like. Uh, well, I mean, I, I will tell you that this is a murderous, genocidal, unnecessary, pointless, horrifying... You talk about looking at things on social media, and I respect that that's how you operate and do it very, very well. I was in Butcher on Sunday. Now, the Kremlin unbelievably are claiming that in Butcher, immediately after the withdrawal of Russian troops, 30th, 31st of March, that the Ukrainian army went in and scattered around the town, in the streets, in courtyards, in backyards, the dead bodies of Ukrainians to create a false flag operation to incriminate the Russian troops. You talk about war crimes and war crimes being uh, carried out by both sides. Mm. I mean, 
We have seen some disturbing evidence um, of alleged war crimes by Ukrainian soldiers against Russian captive soldiers, and I would hope that the Ukrainians would prosecute those and bring the people, the perpetrators of those war crimes, if they happen to justice. But I think disproportionately, George, the, the war crimes and the genocide and the murder and the terror... And you ask me how the war will end? It shouldn't end by a NATO aggression. It shouldn't end by a no-fly zone. We don't want a sort of third world war. It has to end by the Russian people finally coming to the realisation that this is a murderous, dark, evil regime that has to be got rid of by the Russian people. Well, very powerful indeed. Let's get a view from, speaking of nuclear reactors, a man who for the American Navy was an operator uh, of a nuclear reactor uh, belonging to the United States Navy. Nowadays, he lives in Russia, uh, where he is a security analyst and a senior lecturer in international relations. His name is Mark Sloboda, and he joins us now from Moscow. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, George. It's always an honour and a pleasure to be on the show. Mark, what could be the best scenario for a way out of this crisis? OK, so uh, first I would say that there are are no best scenarios. There are, there are no good scenarios for out of this crisis. This crisis is not a good one. It is not uh, something that is, uh, should be considered progressing well for either side of this conflict. And I don't believe that it is something that is going to end soon, nor is it going to end well. Um, all uh, military conflicts eventually end with a diplomatic settlement of some kind. But before they do, there has to be military facts created on the ground. So while the two sides are engaged in a type of diplomatic negotiation right now, I don't think that either side is showing that it is serious about ending the conflict. Uh, any time in the near future, because they have not reached the point where either side would convince them to compromise on their positions, uh, whether it be Russia's demands uh, to uh, the West-backed Kiev regime or you know uh, the Kiev regime trying to um, minimize the, the amount of demands that it is forced to accept uh, from Russia uh, to end the conflict. To be more practical, is it possible that the governments of Russia and the Ukraine can agree uh, to at least some of each other's demands and put an end to this war? Um, Russia's demands for ending the conflict are um, that uh, Ukraine uh, becomes a neutral country, that they do not join NATO or any other military alliance. Um, and that they do not de facto join NATO, i.e. there are no Ford military bases in the country. The Ford military do not come there, conduct joint exercises and do drills, that there isn't large amounts of foreign armaments entering the country. So kind of a, a legal and a de facto uh, not joining of NATO, becoming a true uh, neutral uh, nation, while uh, the Kiev regime is then demanding security guarantees if they were to accept that. And there's a big open question about what type of security guarantees, who would be the guarantors and, and, and so forth. Um, the other demands are that the Kiev regime recognizes that Crimea voted in a referendum to join Russia and that that is irreversible that the Donetsk and Lugansk national republics in their administ full administrative regions, which uh, it has to be said they do not yet at this moment even fully control, um, are independent states. And Russia has also made uh, demands for the demilitarization and the denazification of Ukraine. And those are very vaguely defined terms. They have very real meanings, but they are fluid. Could other countries be helpful in bringing this conflict to an end? I'm thinking perhaps of China or even the West. Uh, could they be helpful in bringing about an end to this? Yeah, uh, so, so uh, first of all, the West is uh, doing their best to, well, 
end the conflict on you, the Kiev regime terms that they back, uh, one by flooding the country with weapons. Uh, they've already delivered some 60,000 man uh, anti-tank weapons, advanced anti-tank weapons to the country. Some 20,000 uh, man uh, air portable defense systems, man pads uh, to the country. And they're talking about bringing in uh, uh, Soviet legacy air defense systems, um, uh, tanks, and other uh, heavier military units in the stockpiles of former Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, also, the West is conducting a, a literally existential economic war of sanctions on Russia. And by that, they had hoped, and they still do hope, to uh, basically destroy the Russian economy or make the lives of Russian citizens so miserable uh, that they turn on their own government and demand an end to the war in order to end sanctions. Uh, China is playing more of a neutral role, um, uh, at least in the public face. Um, politically, they are quietly backing Russia. They've supported Russia on numerous UN Security Council resolutions. They're certainly uh, uh, continuing economic relations with Russia in several uh, uh, vital areas. In other areas, uh, you know, they are they are keen to avoid U.S. sanctions, but also creating alternative mechanisms uh, to continue uh, trade with Russia. Mark, you're a former U.S. Navy man. You're living in Moscow. Uh, what do you think the people there in Moscow, in Russia, uh, want to achieve from this? Yeah. Um, so the hope, the uh, you know, part of the logic behind the uh, economic war on Russia was that uh, Russians' lives would so immediately become immiserated uh, that there wouldn't be support. Uh, for the intervention. In fact, there would be protests, demands. That has not happened. In fact, instead, there has been a rally around the flag effect. And uh, polls out in the last week by the oppositionist pollster, Levada, which has received funds from the West, actually, um, shows grudgingly that uh, actually support for the Russian military intervention is some 81%. And Putin's approval rating since the intervention began has jumped from 59% to 84%. Um, so the Russian people right now, uh, there is not a significant sanctions effect because primarily because of the strength of the ruble. Right now, if I had to say, you know, just uh, anecdotally from my own experience, that it looks like uh, actually the blowback of sanctions with the energy prices and the inflation uh, in Europe right now is having a worse effect on European citizens than it is in Russians. Now, eventually that may change. It could possibly change. But right now, from what I've seen, the stores are full. People are shopping as normal. They're discussing the conflict, uh, you know, in casual conversations, but it's mostly supportive. In fact, I think that there is a strong sentiment from a large percentage of the Russian population fearing that the Kremlin will give up too early, that after incurring this type of costs um, so far, you know, politically, economically, uh, the lives of Russian soldiers that will be lost, the lives of Ukrainians uh, caught up in the conflict with the regime, which is very important to Russians because there are some 5 million Ukrainians living in Russia and some 11 million Russians uh, have family, uh, in, particularly in eastern Ukraine. So it's very close to them. They're very involved and actually, I would say, far more knowledgeable about what is happening and has been happening for the last eight years in Ukraine than the average Westerner. And they're afraid that the government may not go far enough, may back down and not put a permanent end to this conflict and that it may come back to bite the country. Jyoti, uh, apart from your own perspicacity, what, what made you write that book about the drive to war against Russia and China? Did you see all this coming? Do you know, George, it was actually the coup in Ukraine. 
Um, there's a lot of people today walking around with their blue and yellow twibbons saying, I stand with Ukraine. Well, 2004, 14 made me feel I needed to stand with Ukraine, with the people who'd had a fascist government foisted onto them um, by force, the government they'd elected on the basis of friendly relations with Russia and a good, you know, neutral position where good trade relations and good political relations were held with East and with West. That was what the Ukrainian people voted for. It was removed from them by force, by the West, because it wasn't in line with Western objectives. And the West has long used fascists and ultra-nationalists in Ukraine as a weapon against first the Soviet Union and then against Russia. So I stood with Ukraine in 2014. Um, and as part of uh, what was then called the Bristol Ukraine Anti-Fascist Solidarity, we had pickets every week outside the BBC protesting about the fact that they weren't covering this properly, they weren't explaining what had been going on, they weren't talking about the war that had been launched against those people in Ukraine who said no to the imposition of the coup regime. They weren't talking about the death and destruction. They weren't talking about the arming and training of fascists. They weren't talking about the fact that British military advisers were in Ukraine from all through that time and have been ever since. You know, that this is not an independent government. It's not the internal affairs of Ukrainians. This is very much uh, a controlled comprador government installed by the West for its own geopolitical reasons to, to loot and pillage Ukraine and to use Ukraine as a base against Russia. Uh, it is NATO aggression that's going on uh, and it is part of the move, it's part of that drive to war against Russia that we're seeing sort of in slow motion. So when I look at what's happening today, I don't see Russian aggression. I see Russia after eight years finally taking necessary steps to defend itself and its people. You know, uh, your contributor there, Mark Svoboda, talked about how Russians are very knowledgeable about the war in Ukraine. That's because for eight years, they've been watching the war in the Donbass on their televisions in the way that we haven't. It's been disappeared by our media, but in Russian media, it's been covered. And so they know this war's been ongoing all that time and they care about it very deeply. And they're very happy that finally, uh, President Putin and the Russian people have gone to the aid of the Russians across the border. They know that that war is also directed against them. They're not stupid. Why didn't uh, the Russians then only move into the, to the Donbass uh, to garrison it and defend it from what they say was an imminent Ukrainian military attack? Why go all the way to Kiev? Well, I'm not a military expert, George, but from what I've understood from the military experts who have you know, been making their commentary, essentially... They needed to neutralise the ability of the Ukrainian army, which, remember, is being lavishly funded, trained and armed by the West, by NATO. So the Ukrainian army is like a funnel for NATO weapons. And if they can't neutralise that, just, just propping up and, and supporting the Donbass is not going to work. It will, they will get bogged down in endless warfare as, the, you know, Ukraine with NATO help keeps attacking and attacking and attacking them. So they've made it clear that they have to neutralise the Ukrainian proxy government's ability to keep, to keep fighting them. Otherwise, it will be an endless war. Hugh, you don't agree, please. Well, it, the programme's called Kalima Hora. Your say, you're entitled, you people are entitled to your opinions. I respect your opinions. But, um, you know, it's nonsensical. This, this man, Mark, I mean, you know, I, I've not come across him before, but he looked as though he was broadcasting in from the International Space Station. What I would say about his interview was that, meanwhile, back on planet Earth, the Russian army is committing unspeakable war crimes. We've got to talk about that. I have no illusions about the Zelensky government. I am an anti-fascist. There is definitely a fascist element, particularly in the western of Ukraine. I have no... I'm, I, I, can, I can agree with you about that, but we have got to talk about what is happening on the ground. What is the kind of rationalisation for the attack on Kramatorsk railway station? What is the rationalisation for Butcher? I mean, the three points that Mark made, there isn't a deal that Zelensky can make at the moment with Putin, because the people in Ukraine have been so traumatised by this genocidal war since the 24th of February that they will not allow him to sit down and sign a peace treaty with Putin. They well, that's clear. They, that, that's they, clear they don't want to live with a maniac for a neighbour any mm. longer. So we can't... Have... How, how, do you, 
How do you change that? Well, I, 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 the Russian people need to decide... But, but the Russian that, people overwhelmingly support him, as that, you've just heard. I don't believe that's true. No? And, unless well, you, look, unless you, uh, unless not much nuance in this debate so far, but at least it is fiery. We'll be right back after the break. debate here in London on Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin television about the war in Ukraine and hopefully in the second half moving on to how it should end how it might end but Jerry Downing sat patiently uh, through a, a, a televisual dogfight it's only fair that he's up next Jerry what's your take on it Right, I think that that's the, the, the nature of the state that emerged in Ukraine after the 2014 coup uh, is an apartheid state. Uh, that state uh, discriminates against Russian people, it discriminates against ethnic Russians, uh, it, it makes their languages, not alone the, the Russian language, but every other language apart from Ukrainian, practically illegal. You must remember that uh, uh, as a home language, apparently, up to 43% use Russian in their homes. So it's, it's not just a small little uh, language. Uh, and therefore, a state that, that doesn't uh, 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 allow the, its, its, its minority to, to uh, uh, participate is a, a, an illegitimate state, in my view. The first major thing that happened after the coup was the massacre in the trade union house uh, uh, in, in Odessa. That massacre was carried out by the right sector and, and, and the Azov battalion. They proudly boasted about what they did. They showed, we, we can show the, 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 the actual photographs of them firebombing uh, and, and of course the woman that was, was murdered uh, strangled, the pregnant cleaner that was strangled and the man that strangled her, he, he goes to the window and he puts up his thumb and there's a huge roar of approval from the, from the, from the crowd below. The, this, this, this was a, a fascist mob that now moved eastwards in, into Mariupol uh, on the 9th of May and, and began the, the task of oppressing the, the, the Russian-speaking people there. So. What is now happening in Mariupol? What is now happening in Mariupol is this is the headquarters of the Nazi Azov Battalion. They are dug in there and they're using the, uh, um, the, 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 the apartment buildings as, as, as shelter. They are bombing and uh, using the population of, of, of Mariupol as a, a human shields. The people that come out of, of there tell us the truth about what, what's happening, about what the Azov battalion uh, did to them. Uh, so I, I do need to point out that, that the war propaganda that's, that's issuing from every orifice of the capitalist state is, is absolutely appalling. Uh, I'll put it to you, why would, for instance, Assad gas his own people when he was winning the war? He gassed his own people in order to give the West the opportunity to bomb him. That's why he did it. Uh, and then why would the, the Russians actually bomb that, 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 that railway station when that's the Russian-speaking people that live in that area that they want to rule over when they take over? Bucha, why would uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mayor of Bucha, why would he... Uh, make a speech on, on the day after the, the Russians had left without mentioning this terrible massacre. This terrible massacre didn't appear for, for uh, uh, two days afterwards and the terrible massacre appeared when the Azov battalion went in and started mopping up the people that they said were supporting the Russians. 
That's was it the, that's where the and the big mass grave. Well, the, the 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 funny thing about the big mass grave was there were people in body bags in the big uh, in the big mass grave. That was a that was a, a mass grave that the civilian population had asked the Russians to provide for the for the people that had been killed by the shelling from the Ukrainians. So we are getting a story uh, uh, that that that's full of lying propaganda from 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 the West. Now, I think that, that uh, you will not have a proper state in Ukraine, a proper nation in Ukraine, uh, until the Azov Battalion are defeated. I don't want to, to, to make any sort of uh, uh, apology for, the, for, 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 for Putin and what he is. I, I'm quite aware that he's a brutal dictator. I'm quite aware that there are far rightists within the, the army, etc. And I'm quite aware that there's, there's been some atrocities. But uh, this is a war of aggression by NATO and the West against Russia in order to uh, uh, balkanize it, split it up into five republics they want to split it up into. Um, Biden didn't make a mistake when he said he wanted regime change. That's what he wants. Ben Norton uh, is a, a very uh, highly respectable journalist, writer, and filmmaker. He's an American, but he lives in Nicaragua. Let's take uh, an American perspective from him. Ben, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, not many predicted uh, this uh, invasion by Russia of Ukraine. I myself bet my house that it wouldn't happen. Thankfully, nobody took me up on it. Uh, but uh, now that it has happened, what uh, do you think is the likely outcome of all of this bloodshed, all of this dreadful, ghastly affair? Well, what the world wants is a peaceful resolution. Unfortunately, it's actually the US, the European Union and NATO, which are opposing peace talks. We've seen this again and again. In fact, the Washington Post just acknowledged this is one of the main US newspapers very close to the US government. It just admitted that many NATO countries do not want peace talks in Ukraine because they're worried that if Kiev gives in to these demands by Moscow, that it could weaken NATO. So they are willing to fight to the last Ukrainian in order to bleed Russia. And Elliot Cohen, a former US State Department official who served in the Bush administration, he published an article in the Atlantic magazine boasting that the US and NATO are waging a proxy war on Russia through Ukraine. So unfortunately, the reality is that we see that the Western powers are committed to escalating and prolonging this war. Now, hip hypocritically, they accuse Russia of prolonging the war, but they're the ones that are flooding Ukraine with weapons. And they're the ones who are pushing Ukraine, telling Ukraine not to give in and telling Ukraine not to engage in diplomacy with Russia. So, I mean, unfortunately, it's hard to be optimistic about that, but the reality is that the Russian military has already accomplished many of its goals in Ukraine, and it's going to win this war. And unfortunately, NATO is committed on pushing as many Ukrainians to die, to sacrifice themselves on NATO's behalf until eventually Ukraine does have to come to a political solution to this conflict. Look, for most people, this war began when Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, they don't know, some don't want to know, uh, that it actually began many years before that. But it has allowed, undoubtedly, uh, Western media and the Western political class to uh, organize a very substantial feeling, in Western countries at least, that Russia is the villain, the aggressor, the attacker, the invader. Uh, what's the Russian point of view on that? Now, what is Russia calling for? Russia is calling for Ukraine to demilitarize, to be neutral, not to join NATO, and to denazify. I think around the world, many people see those demands as honestly pretty moderate demands. Neutrality should be an obvious concession. I mean, why, why does Ukraine have to be part of NATO? Why does Ukraine have to continue to be integrated into this Western military alliance? So the reality is that, I want to stress this point again, there's one solution to this conflict that is a political solution. And unfortunately, although all of the Western media blames Russia, it's, the reality is that it's Washington, Brussels, and NATO 
that continue to push to escalate. Well, the New York Times does say that many NATO sources tell them that they want the conflict to continue. I don't think the Times is lying about that. But what could Russia do uh, to uh, de-escalate, to uh, bring about a ceasefire, to bring about the possibility of a diplomatic solution? Well, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that Russia was pushed to the stage of invading Ukraine after all of its security red lines were crossed, after it repeatedly asked the Western powers to come to binding security guarantees. Let's not forget that in late 2021, Moscow said very clearly, these are our demands, and the US and NATO refused to abide by any of those. They refused to say that, that Ukraine would not be part of NATO. They refused to return to basic arms control. It was the Trump administration, Donald Trump, that tore up the, the, one of the main accomplishments of peace between the US and the former Soviet Union. And he tore up this interballistic missile treaty that would allow the US to put interballistic missiles inside Ukraine threatening Russia. So the reality is that Russia has repeatedly said what it has wanted and what can Russia do to, to de-escalate this conflict? Well, of course, it can eventually withdraw its troops. But what's incredible is that the Western media and Western governments constantly say that the solution to this conflict is one-sided, that all the only way to end it is that all that needs to happen is Russia needs to withdraw its troops. But this is not a one-sided conflict. Well, you'll know in Nicaragua the phrase guerra prolongera, the long war, uh, because uh, that emanated from the struggle in Nicaragua. Uh, are we in for a guerra prolongera, a long war, a prolonged war uh, between NATO, Ukraine and Russia? Of course, I can't tell the future. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can say that the U.S. government, many figures in the U.S. government have made it clear that they want a long-scale civil war, a long-term civil war prolonged in Ukraine to create an insurgency. They have said this quite clearly. And this is in addition to the eight years of civil war that we've already seen since 2014 in Ukraine. Hillary Clinton went on TV and said very clearly that the U.S. should repeat the policy that it carried out in Afghanistan in the 1980s of creating an insurgency. I want to remind our viewers that that U.S. policy in the 1980s in Afghanistan is what gave birth to al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And of course, in Ukraine, it goes without saying that there are many far-right extremists, including neo-Nazis, who have burrowed themselves into the sinews of the, stru the state structures of Ukraine. They are part of the National Guard. They are part of the military. They are part of the state security services. And the U.S. and NATO are talking about a long-term, large-scale insurgency in Ukraine, which is very likely would result in a situation like in Afghanistan that could unleash these extremist forces that go on to carry, carry out terrorist attacks in other countries. So this is a very dire situation. The reality is that we are in this situation that could be very dangerous, that could lead to a large, prolonged war in Eastern Europe that could spill into neighboring countries like, like Poland, which is sending weapons and potentially fighter jets into Ukraine, which could potentially make it a target. And there's a very real possibility that this war could escalate into a world war. Hugh Ben's uh, right, isn't he? I mean, uh, it's from the other point of view to you, but you both have reached the same conclusion that a negotiated settlement is not possible because the Ukrainian demands are for regime change in Moscow and Moscow's demands are for things that you say, and I'm sure you're right at this point, that the, uh, the political class, at least in Ukraine, would not allow him to sign. Ergo, we do have a, a long-term war lasting many years and potentially spilling over into the neighbourhood. Well, it's a long question. The first thing you said was Ben's right, isn't he? And I don't think Ben is right. I mean, I don't feel that in his contribution or indeed in right. Mark's contribution or in many of the contributions that there has been a requisite level of knowledge and information about what is happening on the ground. That's just my point of view. Now, you may be right and I may be wrong. I've been there. I've seen these things. I've seen them from a very balanced anti-fascist perspective, a socialist perspective. Um, but I have to tell you that people's lives and families and jobs 
and dreams and children and pets are being destroyed. And that's got to stop. The Russian troops about. have to withdraw. They have and to go they, back into their own country. And if they don't, the war will go on. That's what I'm trying the war, to do. It isn't the, it, no, the polit it isn't the... You are right that the political class won't allow Zelensky to sign it. The ordinary people of Ukraine have suffered so much that they won't allow Zelensky to what sign a peace deal. What about the 40% Russian speakers? It's, it's, just, it's just not... I mean, the Russian speakers in Lugan... Mark, Jerry made this point. Mark made this point about the people in Lugansk and, and Donetsk. The Russian speakers in Lugansk and... Donetsk, the people that I care most about in Ukraine, they have been so appalled by the prospect of the future under Putin that is being presented to them that of those people speaking Russian, I've been in Donetsk, in Lugansk, I went through the point of contact. Not, not and there the are, last few weeks, there are, I, I have been in the last few weeks. You were in the east? I was in the, I was in the east in the last few weeks. I mean, it depends where you call the point of contact, but I was... Were, were you in the, the new republics? Uh, I was on the edge of the New Republics. Yeah. OK. Yeah. The point I'm making is that people who came out of the New Republics, refugees from the New Republics, who we came... Came west. Who came west. That wasn't many, was it? It wasn't many, but there are many Russian speakers who've decided they don't want to speak Russian. I mean, I totally agree with you. I'm on the side of the Russian speakers, and I do think that as a minority, they haven't been protected. And there's, as I say, a fascist element in the Ukrainian government. I don't deny that. But I am talking about the value of human life which it's important that politicians kind of prioritise. Uh, Jyoti, although Hugh doesn't want to acknowledge the actual uh, confluence of his view and Ben's, both of them are really saying is that, that there will be no peaceful solution, there will be no negotiation. Uh, so all the talks in Turkey and so on are therefore really window dressing, aren't they? This war is going to drag on and on. I wouldn't like to say it will definitely drag on and on. Um, I think facts on the ground are being made. Uh, there is an opportunity for Ukraine to accept the facts on the ground. The question is very much whether Zelensky and the people around him uh, are in any position to accept facts on the ground, because the reality is they've been shown very clearly to be total puppets of the USA. And at this moment in time, the USA and Britain and the NATO powers are not prepared to accept facts on the ground. Nevertheless, the facts are being made and it may well come to a point where they are forced to accept those, uh, which is exactly why, as, as Jerry pointed out, I mean, many in Russia are worried that um, the, the Russian operation will be brought to a close a bit too soon when the NATO powers realise the facts on the ground and try to make a compromise that doesn't really allow the war to be properly ended, but, but leaves a kind of stalemate that drags on and on and on. You know, we've heard a lot about, you know, Zelensky's under pressure from the Ukrainian people. This is not true. He was elected on a hope, on a wish by people for peace because he's Jewish, because he's Russian speaking, because he looked as if he might be able to bring the war in Ukraine to a close. That was his platform. That was why he was elected. That's what the people of Ukraine really wanted. He couldn't deliver that. He couldn't deliver that because he's a puppet president. He has no control. He couldn't talk peace with the Azov. They stuck two fingers up at him. They sent him packing and he was made to look very foolish when he did a little bit of trying to talk peace on the border and since then he had to backtrack from that position. But he's basically an actor, you know, uh, and he's there to fulfil a role and he's being dressed up. And it's, you know, it's, it's sad for me to hear Hugh talk and say, use the language of socialism to cover what are essentially imperialist talking points from start to finish, you know, and anybody who tries to They're present... They're not imperialist. I'm talking about the pointless taking of human life. That, 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 there's no imperialism in that. I'm talking about the murder of innocent people, indiscriminately, pointlessly. The, That's not about imperialism. These so just... are allegations for which I have seen no, no substantiating evidence. You know, the people who are pushing these allegations are part of a CIA-controlled media operation. Am I part of a, a cia It is a psychological... I, I don't know. I, well, I've been Maybe. there. I don't know you. You think I might be part of... It's possible. Of a... Perfectly possible. There is... It's again, very a... deep cover. It's very deep cover. <laughs> there is a huge psychological operation. There's a psychological warfare being waged against the people of the West 
in order to make them believe that Vladimir Putin is some kind of evil maniac. And you don't believe they, he is? No, of course not. What do you of mean, course of course not. not? There's no of course well, not. Well, if he were a controversial evil. point, you don't believe... Not to me. A, well, you don't believe that were, Vladimir well, Putin, the Hugh, fascist, Hugh, is an evil fascist. maniac. Well, Hugh, if he were an evil maniacal fascist, and the I'm asking her whether she believes he the, is. I'm not saying and, I believe and, he is. And the opposition pollsters record phenomenal levels of support for him in Russia, ipso facto, that would make the Russian people that you say you love, lovers of a genocidal... Uh, mentally ill fascist, and that that's hyperbole with rockets on it. Are we talking about the Levada poll or a p telephone polling? If somebody, if I was living in Putin's gangster kingdom, and somebody rang me up on the telephone and said, "Do you support Vladimir Putin?" and my children are playing in the sitting room, I'd probably say yes. I'd these be frightened. Are, okay. George, I'm sorry, these are imperialist talking points. When, yeah. they, when they describe Vladimir Putin as a dictator, as a gangster, what they're saying is he has the temerity to head a government that stands up for that, Russia. Tell us what That's you That's what think they mean. Is. Tell us what you think, Vladimir. Don't, don't worry about what the imperialists think he is. What do you think Vladimir Putin is? But you, you, Just, you, you know, you, it's interesting. You cannot, no, no, it's Jerry. an interesting point. You, 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 well, cannot, discuss, time, so you, you cannot discuss international politics on the basis of good against evil. That, that's Judeo-Christian like, nonsense. Do you, Jerry, what we have, believe Vladimir Putin well, he already is? Told no, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not good. He's satisfied. I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely admit that Putin is an absolute but scoundrel. But Jyoti doesn't think no, that. But, I, but apart from that, what is yeah. the issues involved? The issues involved is... That, that NATO and, and, and the West are attempting to... I agree. To, 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 I to, agree to, with that. ..to, to uh, 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 over the regime change in Russia. They are attempting to... And, and were they to succeed in that, of course, the position of the working class in Russia would be ten times worse that's than it is that's now. That's what Hugh but, wants as well, regime change it, in Russia. You know, well, no, for, the, for the sake so of the... Right, I, I the whole don't thing. Fair. Not, not you, imposed you know, from outside. Not you know, it's not outside. good and evil. Well, it's, 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 Jerry it's, makes it's, a good it's, point. The working class of Russia, Ukraine and the United Kingdom have an awful lot in common. They should be united. There's a solidarity there. These are good points. The, the idea that I'm making imperialist kind of arguments is nonsensical. Not, yeah, okay, but, but the programme's it, not about you. you just, and I know it's not, not about anybody I'm being, I'm, I'm being attacked. It's I just want to make the point. Ukraine. You can't have moral equivalence fallacy just because NATO is evil just because America is wrong, but I don't just because, any just, of the evil stuff. just because of the crimes of British imperialism, doesn't evil. mean one is entitled to Holy take God innocent person. people's lives. Okay, although that happens all the time, as you well know, including but there is wars no that justification you for it. Of no. course, it happens all the time. But endlessly, whenever you talk to people about what the Russian army are doing, they tell you about what awful things Shall other I people have done. Shall tell you about what? Our armies did in Iraq. No, that's my point. Let's huh? talk about what the topic we're on here to discuss. You don't want is... to talk about what I, I, our I, I, government did in Syria. I talk you about it all the time. The Read my manifesto. Read my Gaza. manifesto. I didn't know you had a manifesto. But I'm determined that this programme should not be about you <laughs> or about any of the guests. It's about Ukraine. the war in Ukraine. Not and Syria. The... No, but... It's about Ukraine. Most, Let's talk about Ukraine. Most Are... viewers will have noticed a certain double standard in the vehemence and, in fact, the, frankly, edging on the unhinged use of demonic language uh, 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 and, and Manichaean... Uh, 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 That's uh, demonic false... language. No, <laughs> actually, no, you... That's you demonic, language. demonic language. You're the, using uh, it now. The show. No. You're using well, it now. I think most viewers uh, have probably already concluded that we're not going to find agreement <laughs> around this but room. Neither it are may, Zelensky and Putin. It may... Uh, well, <laughs> can I, can you I seem I... to wish that to be true, and that perhaps is telling... I don't... Uh, what, what, it's, it's not about me. I thought it wasn't no, about me. You, you, you keep it, saying what I wish. It's quite clear... Talking about it's Ukraine. It's quite clear that the West does not wish... Uh, a negotiated solution to emerge. Uh, and therefore, that means the war goes on. That means all the crocodile tears about the costs of the war are just that, crocodile tears. If you want the war to end, you have to be prepared to negotiate an end to it. If you want the war to continue, uh, then, frankly, uh, people will uh, judge your motives accordingly. Not much light emerged from this show this evening, but a lot of heat, and I hope 
that the audience enjoyed it. I've been George Galloway. This All is right. Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Okay. I wish you good night.